Weapons inspectors on the ground in Syria. After a couple of tense days, the Assad government and opposition groups agree to the briefest of ceasefires to let the experts go to the scene of the largest chemical weapons attack on the outskirts of Damascus. And it was this woman, Angela Kane, who led the negotiations on the ground on behalf of the United Nations. A career UN diplomat from Germany, Angela Kane brought to bear 20 years of diplomatic experience to make it happen. Now she and the inspectors, who technically work on behalf of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the World Health Organization, are getting ready for the crucial stage, determining how much chemical agents the regime has stockpiled and destroying it, all of it. With civil war raging, questions abound. Can it be done? Is the time frame realistic? And what about Russian allegations that the inspections were politicized? Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, let's examine all this with Angela Kane, the UN's High Representative for Disarmament. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank You've you been me. working on Syria's chemical weapons for a long time now. The first calls for an investigation were back in March. At various points, it looked like it was going nowhere. Was there any point at which you were giving up hope? I think there was a point, James. And actually, uh, when the uh, original request came from the government of Syria to the Secretary General to investigate the incident in Khan al-Assal, that was uh, the 19th of March. And then we uh, had a number of other governments which had asked the Secretary General also to investigate the same incident and then some other incidents. And in the initial negotiations, it was very difficult to come to an agreement. And uh, there was a hiatus of a couple of weeks, even two, three months. And I thought, oh, it's not going to happen. And I think the breakthrough really came when the Syrian government reached out and invited uh, Professor Selstrom, the team leader, and myself to come to Damascus to negotiate again how we could best move this forward. That was the breakthrough. You went to Damascus on two different occasions, and I remember here at the UN, diplomats briefing me. They didn't think the mission was going to succeed. Tell us how you managed to persuade the Syrians to let the team in. I'm not sure that it's really persuasion. If there hadn't been the will, political will of the Syrian government to cooperate with us, they wouldn't have invited us. And I think that going there, already I had the sense that they are inviting us because they want to make progress. Uh, I think it was just a matter of agreeing on the modalities. They wanted us to investigate Khan al-Assal, and uh, we finally made an agreement with them. It was a very tough negotiation. Uh, and uh, we agreed that we would investigate Khan al-Assal, the original request, as well as some other governments, as well as two other locations that we said we wanted to remain undisclosed for security reasons. We did not want any evidence to be destroyed in the meantime, and we also wanted to consult with the team leader and the team as to which ones they were. Then we may very quickly made an agreement with the government uh, and concluded the legalistic framework under which that could uh, take place and put the team together, and then the team was there and actually De uh, deployed to Damascus on, I think it was the 17th or the 18th of August. And then that attack came on the 21st of August. Your reaction when you heard about that? I think my reaction was just like everyone else's. There were immediate pictures that, was on that were on YouTube, and it was pretty horrifying to see the first-hand attacks and to see the first-hand reports of the victims lying on the ground, the dead bodies. I think everyone was very horrified. And uh, the Secretary General immediately asked me to fly to Damascus to see if that agreement that we had, which was limited to the three sites that we had identified, could be expanded with the Syrian government's understanding and agreement to include those attacks of the 21st of August. So I arrived in Damascus. I immediately met with the Vice Foreign Minister and then continued negotiating the next day with the Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, and they agreed to actually let us investigate those attacks. At the time, there was lots of questions. Would they actually find anything? Would there be enough time? Would, would there be too much time to have passed before the inspectors actually got there? That wasn't a problem in the end. No, I, I, th I have always been surprised by those questions because basically it's not like if there is a chemical weapons use that it is disappears any trace of it within a couple of days. 
the chemical weapons very often stay in the environment, in the bodies, in the biomedical samples, you know, blood and urine for months. So it's not like if you investigate this after a couple of days, uh, it has already evaporated. In fact, this is the first time that you've had a chemical weapons use investigation within four or five days after the attack happened. It's never happened before. And I think this is part of the reason why the team came back with such large body of, of samples and convincing evidence that chemical weapons were used. You were in Damascus all the time the team was there. How difficult was their work? How difficult was it operating in a war zone? You know, I, I think anyone who wasn't there will have a hard time sharing, I mean, he will have a hard time imagining this. I thought it was incredible. I pay great tribute to the team leader, uh, Professor Selstrom. I pay great tribute to the men and the women of OPCW and WHO, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and the World Health Organization. They gave us the doctors, the OPCW gave us the chemical weapons experts, munitions experts, and um, we negotiated the access. Now, the negotiating the access, what did that mean? The areas of the 21st uh, August incident were in, not in government-controlled areas, but they were in rebel-held areas. So the government said, we guarantee your security, but when you leave the government zone, we cannot guarantee your security. There's a buffer zone. So what happened is that we had to agree with the government for a ceasefire, and we agreed for certain hours of the day there would be the ceasefire. Uh, and then the team would go in. And then we negotiated with the rebels that held that particular stretch uh, of, of the suburbs of Damascus to, uh, to not only let us in and guarantee the safety, but also to set up the team in helping them. You cannot just go to a certain street corner and say, well, here I am, and please give us your victims. But you have to set it up beforehand. You want to talk to the doctors, the first responders, healthcare workers. You want to talk to victims. You basically want to get a whole story behind it in addition to the interviews and everything. So it's very, very difficult to set that up. And you came under attack? The very first day, the very first day that the team set out, they were deliberately targeted by snipers. We don't know who did it, but it was a very scary experience. And I remember that, um, you know, the Secretary General and, and I, if you so want, am ultimately also responsible for the safety of the team. It's not easy to say, but you know, wouldn't you go back? Don't do go back. We need that mission to succeed. I think that everyone would have understood if they said the security is just unacceptably high, I mean, unacceptably rather low, and so therefore we cannot continue this mission. But the team itself decided, no, no question, we need to do this job, we need to go back. I must say I have really very high personal regard and admiration for their bravery of doing this. They've now reported how important is the Selstrom report? As I mentioned before, it's never been done before that you have such a well-documented uh, report on, a chemical, on chemical weapons use. I think if you've looked at it, you've seen how thorough it is. Uh, it is broken down in various parts. And what it shows is that the, the team not only took the biomedical samples, that's like the blood, the urine, the hair, Together from the, from the case studies, they have a whole interviews. It's all documented with uh, videotaping, audio recording, photographs. And then they also have what we call environmental samples. Those are basically the samples they took from the rockets and from the area where the rockets hit, so soil samples. And again, it's, it's unprecedented. It's never happened before, also because it is so fully documented. And what is very important, because there's been a lot of talk about the so-called chain of custody, these samples were taken by the team. They were transported in a private plane to The Hague, to the laboratories. And I should say also that Syria, under the agreement we have with them, is entitled to the samples. So you had two Syrian officials traveling to The Hague with the team to basically receive the samples themselves. Because when the analysis comes, we want to make sure that we have full transparency they can analyze the same samples that we analyzed. You seem to be very happy with the process, and yet there have been criticisms. In the last few hours, last few days, the Russians have been coming out and criticizing the report. The Russian foreign minister or deputy foreign minister says, politicized, preconceived, and one-sided. Well, I don't see how you can politicize whether you found chemical weapons or not. I mean, it's a fact. You found chemical weapons. How can you politicize that? It's there as a fact. The chemical weapons were used. 
there is overwhelming evidence of the use of chemical weapons. The team never had the mandate to attribute who used it. That is not in the Secretary General's mechanism. That's a mechanism agreed by member states, and so they didn't. Why did the Secretary General stick to that mandate? Why didn't he order a full inquiry into who carried out this crime? Because he doesn't have a mandate to that. He does not does have a mandate. Does he not have the power to launch any investigation he wants? Not in this sense, no. I mean, what the Secretary General's mandate for the chemical weapons investigation used is, is basically determined by member states. It was signed off by the Security Council as well. If they want to give him a different mandate, then they can do that, but they haven't. So he would very much, very much have stepped over the authority of the member states, given to him by the member states, to say who did it. And let me share you another thing with you. The report is not complete, and that is a, a, um, a mention that also the Russians and the Syrians have made. They have said, well, this is a partial report. It is true. It is a partial report. And uh, so um, the investigations that we originally agreed to, Khan al-Assad plus two others, have not yet been completed because the team interrupted its work to focus on the 21 August one. The Secretary General said there had to be accountability for the use of chemical weapons. How is that accountability going to happen? I think it's up to member states. We've had um, truth processes, reconciliation processes. We've had the International Criminal Court. There are various mechanisms of dealing with that. And so I think it is now, the evidence is there, it's been used. And so it's now up to the, sec to the uh, member states to see how we're going to put that forward. But they, I think they should be waiting for the full report when it is ready. So do you think the Security Council should refer what was in this report, all of that evidence, chilling evidence, is what the Secretary General said, to the International Criminal Court. James, I would be very much amiss if I made prescriptions for the Security Council. I think they would be very unhappy with me if I made recommendations to them as to what they should or shouldn't do. I think that uh, they're probably already discussing now first the resolution uh, that will be adopted on dealing with the uh, Syrian government acceding to the Chemical Weapons Convention, and I think we need to see that first through. Tell me about the rest of the investigations by the Selstrom team. How soon can they go back? They will go back within days. As a matter of fact, uh, just today I had a number of discussions uh, with uh, uh, both OPCW and WHO and with the team leader, Professor Selstrom, and we are very much hoping that they can go, maybe not Monday, but maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, at the very latest. They're ready to go. And will you go back? Do you need to get fresh permission, or do you already have all the permissions you need? The, the Syrian government has basically said, you can come in whenever you want, and we welcome your coming back. Only to investigate those three incidents that you've agreed on? No, I must correct that. They have, subsequent to the 21 August incident, the Syrian government brought to our attention three subsequent incidents uh, which happened, and that was 22, 24, and 26 August. And uh, so uh, the team will go back to also have a look at those uh, allegations. The mechanism says all credible allegations must be investigated. Clearly, there was not enough time to do that before the team left, because they concentrated on the 21st, but they will look into those allegations now. So a further six will be investigated, to be clear. Whether or not they will be investigated depends on whether they're credible, whether there's enough to be investigated. I cannot really make any predictions. And as you know, it. there are other allegations as well as those six. Will they all be looked at? They have been all looked at. The ones that were received prior to the team going in, they have all been looked at. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to find out if there's actually chemical weapons used. There's not enough evidence, there's no facts, there's nothing to base yourself on. What we do, and this is also very interesting that people don't know, is um, if a government brings to our attention the alleged use of chemical weapons, we turn around and we send the government that has brought this to our attention a very detailed questionnaire with a lot of questions with, which give us facts to make a preliminary determination whether or not we can actually have something there to investigate. We've done that in all of the cases, and that is also the basis for determining is it worth investigating, is it credible, or is it not? Do you send your questionnaire to the opposition too, because they often have a very different view of events? No, we have not. We are a, uh, in, an organization that deals with member states. We do not deal with the opposition. And then, maybe I can turn this around, do you know who we should send it to? It is difficult. It's a very divided opposition. That's but right. 
there will be investigations on the ground that would involve talking to the opposition, I assume. And actually, uh, when we went to the investigate, when we investigated the 21 uh, uh, August incident, we had a lot of cooperation from the uh, from the opposition. So uh, they uh, they basically helped the team tremendously on the ground. They would not have been able to do what they did in terms of the fact finding activities had it not been for the help and support of the opposition. You talk about the security in a country where there's been a war raging for two and a half years, and there's a small pool of these specialized scientists. Is it hard to find the people to volunteer for this sort of work? The answer is yes and no. I think that people do not voluntarily expose themselves to danger, and I think the first sniper attack the first day brought home how dangerous it really is. But I think that uh, for them it was also an unprecedented opportunity to participate in something that is really history making. And I think that that motivated a lot of them. I, I must share with you how this actually evolved. The team in the morning, they would get together and they would gather all of their gear. You know, it's not only the gear that they have, but it's like the, the, the tubes where you store the blood, where you have the urine samples. You have to have special containers that have to be stored at a specific temperature. You have to load all of that into the cars. And then you have to don your own gear. It was 40, 40 plus degrees centigrade temperatures in which they had to work. They had to work practically the whole day. Then in these very tense, tense moments, of, of going, leaving the security of the government zone, going into the rebel held territories, doing the work, uh, and then coming back, and then unloading the car, making sure everything is accounted for, making sure this cust chain of custody is preserved. Then we would say, fine, why don't you go out and rest for, a, a day, for an hour? And then we would meet again to plan the next day. It was incredibly, incredibly stressful for the team. And that's when I said to the government, because they sort of said, well, why can't the team finish the rest of the investigations? And I said, look, I said, I've been with the team now for a week. And they're exhausted. They need to have a rest. It's not only physical stress, it's also mental stress. You didn't just pull them out because at that time there was the imminent threat of war. It wasn't because... No, no, no. We, we, basically, we basically said the team needed to have a rest. I mean, and I, I, I stand by that because it was my decision to say they needed to go out, they needed to have a rest, and then they can go back. Obviously, the even bigger job now for some of these inspectors is to try and take hold of the Syrian chemical weapons arsenal. How big a job is that and how hard will it be to find all of those experts, OPCW experts? That's a very good question, James, and I don't have an immediate answer for you. I think that once Syria declares its chemical weapons stockpiles, its delivery systems, etc., uh, then we will have more of an impression of what actually is involved. Right now, no one knows. I mean, is it 500 tons? Is it 1,000 tons? Is it less, more? No one knows. The OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, is not actually part of the UN. They've been put in the driving role for this. Is the UN being sidelined, do you think? Well, no, I wouldn't say that, because basically that's their expertise. You know, we don't have chemical weapons expectors. But you ran the previous investigations I with their staff. I, well, it was partially OPCW, majority OPCW, and WHO. That is with correct. With you in charge. With me in charge. It was actually Secretary General's team, if you want. I represented him, so to say. But on the other hand, um, the, uh, the OPCW, as you said, is not part of the UN. I, uh, we had signed a uh, memorandum of understanding with the OPCW precisely for the possibility of putting together a team like we did. And that came in very conveniently because we don't have a team of standing inspectors. OPCW has. WHO has the medical doctors who are specialized in this type of work. So that actually is how we put it together. And will you be helping with their new mission? Will there be a UN component of that? Will you be providing help with logistics and protection of their inspectors? I would expect that it would come out as some kind of a, a joint effort, very strongly so, because uh, OPCW, of course, does not have those facilities. And I think what is important here, let's not forget that, is that what we all want to achieve is to get rid of the chemical weapon stockpiles. We want to eliminate this. So I think we're all pursuing the same goal. Very important. And let me make another plug, because I think that everyone focuses on the chemical weapons now. And yes, it's killed, and it's killed in a horrible way, those poor children, victims, uh, civilians. 
And let's not forget over 100,000 people have been killed in this conflict to begin with in the last two and a half years. So what really is needed is chemical weapons elimination, absolutely priority, but let's not forget the political process to basically bring Syria back from this, this conflict that is raging right now. And given the dangers of this conflict, will those inspectors need the sort of security that perhaps the only, only the UN can provide? Will you consider, for example, troops, blue helmet troops, UN peacekeepers to accompany those inspectors into the more difficult areas? Well, I, I would expect I would expect that uh, the uh, chemical weapons stockpiles that the government will declare will be under government controlled or in government controlled area. There have also been allegations that the opposition holds chemical weapons. I don't know whether that's true. I don't have an opinion on it. Um, and so uh, the uh, security will definitely be an aspect that is very important. Whether or not or how that will be provided, whether blue helmets will really depend on the Security Council. What will the Security Council mandate? What will the Security Council mandate the Secretary General to do? But I think that the underlying purpose is that we very strongly work together with OPCW and we, we have our respective roles, we play them very well. Whether we are in support or they are in support, it doesn't really matter. What is important is that we get this right. President Assad has said it will cost more than a billion dollars and will take at least a year. Do you agree with his assessment? If he makes that assessment, I'm wondering whether one can deduce from that how much chemical weapons there are in, in Syria. It is undoubtedly true that uh, chemical weapons destruction is a very expensive process. But it depends on what materials are there. Some materials or agents are cheaper to destroy than others. So it really, it's very hard to make an estimate right now. And I'm interested to hear that he's made the estimate already. But on the other hand, there are various ways of destroying it. That again is something that is normally, under the Chemical Weapons Convention, that is normally done by the government itself. So I think that President Assad has already said, we, Syria, will not be able to do that. We need the help of the international community. And that will basically mean bilateral assistance or multilateral assistance. But that has to come from member states in that case. How do you check that he has destroyed his stockpile? Will there be surprise inspections as there were, I remember, uh, on Saddam Hussein's weapons sites by the previous missions there in Iraq? Good question. You've clearly done your homework, James. But uh, it's, uh, it, there is a procedure under the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, that is so-called challenge inspections that's never been used. Now, mind you, you know, the Chemical Weapons Convention came into force into 1997. But on the other hand, it's never been used because it, usually, it was expected that if that happened, it could trigger a counter challenge. Uh, I think that is one of the things that need to be looked at that might also be looked at uh, by the OPCW and the so-called Executive Council. The Executive Council has, I think, 41 members right now. They will be meeting to possibly look at a different mandate, an enlarged mandate of the OPCW, and that could well be included in that, that they are be given additional powers in order to address precisely that. I don't know how that's going to be handled. When you look at the deal that was done between the Americans and the Russians, between the Secretary of State and the Russian uh, Foreign Minister, and the talk that all of this could be over by the middle of next year, you're an expert on this. Is that possible? It's highly ambitious. Is it possible? Again, it depends on the magnitude. What are we dealing with? How much is there? It depends on that. But I will, I will say everyone considers it highly ambitious. But if you don't have a goalpost, then you, you don't have something to work for. I think in some countries it's taken a long time to destroy chemical weapons because of the cost, sometimes also because of other consequences, environmental, security. But on the other hand, if there's a will and there's enough resources to do that, I believe it can be done. I think if you want to get anything done that involves a fairly large number of actors, I mean Syria, US, Russian Federation, other multilateral players, uh, you have to be optimistic and you have to be ambitious. Because if you just so say, oh well, you know, it'll take two years or something, I don't think that's acceptable. And I think that what needs to be done is for everyone to work together. It is very clear to me, and I hear this also from the ground, that Syria is very strongly cooperating with already giving information, they're strongly cooperating with the country team, and uh, they're clearly wanting to make this happen. They, c they want to cooperate with the international community. They want to say, fine, we do the declaration on time, 
And then it is basically saying, okay, fine, now it's up to the rest of the international community. OPCW, UN, multilateral actors, security, destruction, inspections. There's a lot of work ahead. And I think some of it is fairly intrusive as well. And I think this is something for a sovereign government that's always a problem. But Syria has voluntarily signed on to that. And I think that that is the best promise that we have, that this will ultimately be successful. Angela Kane, UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you.